frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Don't you understand, George? It's because you were not born. Film church. Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. Did you see that crap? All that horror crap? Things coming out of crates and eating people. Dead people coming back to life. People turning into weeds, for Christ's sake. Well, you want him reading that stuff? All right, then. I took care of it. That's why God made fathers, babe. That's why God made fathers. Hello, and welcome to Film Church Radio's Darnish Horror Month. This is the podcast that treats cinema as a religion. It's Sunday. I'm Brandon. And I'm Lewis. And we are here to reach cinematic enlightenment. Uh, each week, Lewis and I alternate picking a film for both of us to watch and discuss. And since it is the Darnish Horror Month, I picked the film Creep Show from 1982, directed by George A. Romero. Uh, this uh, was a screenplay written by Stephen King. Um, it is an anthology film, so it stars many people, um, including Hal Hallbrook, Adrian Barbu, Fritz Weaver, Leslie Nielsen, Ted Danson, Ed Harris, and many, many more. Um, this is a film that has been on my list for a while. Um, I believe my parents saw the film together uh, back in 90, 1982 when it was in theaters um, before they were married, because uh, I believe they got married in 83. Um, and my dad has only seen this film the one time. I, I think both of my parents have only seen the film the one time, but he brings it up every once in a while because I think it just really creeped him out. <laughs> and I thought maybe I had seen it before, but after watching it, realized I hadn't. I just hear my dad talk about it every once in a while. Um, so we'll get in, into some of the creepy stuff that <laughs> is in this movie as we get into the episode. But both Lewis and I went into this film cold. We didn't know much about it um, other than a few things that, that my dad had said. So hope you enjoy the episode. Keep listening. Um, I'm going to get to the movie here in a bit. Uh, but first, we want to say thanks to everyone who has been listening to the show and please share it with everyone you know so we can spread the love of Film Church and uh, this holy thing that we call cinema. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can, of course, find us on all the social medias at Film Church Radio, um, and we post extra content and little clips and stuff on, on our social media channels. So go find us, give us a like, and share us. Um, before we get into the film, we're going to discuss other films and just chat for a bit. Uh, yeah. Other things that we've been watching this week. Um, so, yeah. How you doing, Lewis? I'm doing good, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing good. I'm enjoying a um, Danish horror month. Um, yeah, it's been good so far. It has. We've had some some crackers, and we're going to get onto creep show in a little bit. But um, getting su sufficiently creeped out. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, what have you been, been watching? It's been a good. It's been a good one. I mean, um, my um, Harold Lloyd. Um, I don't know, like awakening. I guess has been carrying on. So yeah. I watched Never Weaken from nineteen twenty one, um, which is a short. Um, and it's on HBO Max if you want to go and watch it. It's like 22 minutes. And it's kind of the precursor to Safety Last. So okay. um, it it features like similar stunts, I guess. And you can see that kind of idea snowballing into the um, the climax of Safety Last where he's kind of climbing a building, you know, and high above the streets. Yeah. Um, and it was something that I'd read about while kind of reading about Safety Last. And I was like, I'm going to go and watch it. So... Um, like I said, it was only 20 minutes, um, and it's just a great little silent comedy short. Um, and talking of safety last, um, September 29th is now silent movie day. And this oh. was the second year that it had been done. The first year, um, it was set up in a few cinemas around the US um, as just as a kind of a day to show silent films in cinemas. You know, and nice. get people to be like, okay, this is how they're supposed to be watched, you know. Yeah. Um, and then this year it grew a little bit. So there was a cinema, there was a few cinemas in like London and Toronto um, showing them. So it's kind of starting to branch out now, go a bit international. Um, but 
Texas theatre here in Texas um, that I've never been to and is yeah. historically significant for many reasons. Yeah. Um, we're, t- we're taking part. And guess what film they were showing, Brandon? Well, I, I, <laughs> you I know, can't but... guess because I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Safety Last. It was the film that I've watched a couple of times already this year. Um, but I had to go. You know, I had to yeah. go see it on the big screen. And um, it was, like I said, it was my first time at Texas Theatre. So it was just a big event. You know? Yeah, that's it awesome. Was, it was great. Yeah. yeah, I'm so excited you went. I've been wanting to to take you there or get you to go there for a long time because it is yeah. a, a really cool theater. Yeah. And I know it's stupid, but the one thing that's kind of kept me from going is because I am a big guy, I'm six foot five and, you know, pretty, pretty large. Uh, <laughs> I was, de- I was really worried that the seats would be the most uncomfortable things ever <laughs> and that I would just hate being in there, yeah. you know, cause with the old theater seats, I kind of, you don't feel like they're going to be wide enough and there's not going to be enough leg room. And, yeah. um, but it wasn't at all. It was so comfortable, and you know, it, the the theater itself was just so unique. Did you? So the re, during COVID, they they like redid uh, the top floor, and they actually put a second screen in there. So were you on the in the main floor, or were you on the top? It was in the main floor. Okay, yeah, so cool. It was in the in the um, the main auditorium place. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's a really um, cool place. It is. I mean, yeah. And I had just had a look it, on the poster when I came out. And, you know, even though it was Silent Film Day, they'd showed the kid earlier that year, earlier that month, they're showing Nosferatu next month. Yeah. You know, I feel like I've missed out all this time. Yeah. It's been right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they also showed Creep Show the other day, too. They did. Yeah. yeah. And uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to go. But, um, yeah, it seems like since I picked this film, uh, I've been seeing creep show pop up every. Of course, it's also October, but yeah. it seems like there's been a resurgence because I haven't. I, it feels like I haven't heard many people talk about this film. You know, we'll get into that, but yeah. you know, um, but it could be that I'm just paying attention right now. <laughs> yeah, one of those things that you just notice it more. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean that was that was a blast, and getting to see Safety Last again on the big screen was was really really fun. Um, Did it change and- like sit the movie for you at all? Seeing it on the um, big screen, it it was just I, I felt more in it. I mean, you do, don't you? You kind of get yeah. Um, it's not as easy to get distracted, and um, I took my parents and my sister who are in town from England. Yeah, <clears throat> I took them to it. Um, and my sister's never seen a silent movie before, and you know, my dad's seen kind of some Laurel and Hardy stuff, but yeah. they all loved it. Sweet, yeah. And I was like, it worked. You know, yeah. I could just tell that. Um, like on the way back, they were asking questions about him and like how they filmed it and you know all that kind of stuff. And I was like, it worked. You know, yeah. this is somebody that in the future, if there's a silent film, they're not gonna, they're potentially gonna go and see it. You know, yeah, so. that's really cool because I mean, it, I'm I'm sure it feels like such a a unique thing to be able to share mm-hmm. something you love so much with your family like that. In yeah. a theater setting, you know. Yeah, because it's so, it's so much better than just being like, okay, sit on the sofa and want to show you this silent film. Yeah, and people kind of get distracted because it's kind of like pulling their trapped. phones out. Yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> like you can't. You got to watch it. Yeah. You know, um, and yeah, they they were kind of they got really into it. You know, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it was great. Uh, and then because it's been. Obviously, October, there's been a few horror films that I've been trying to tick off. So we finally watched Prey um, from this year, the Predator kind of reboot, prequel, yeah, standalone. Um, it's really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know you've seen it. Um, yeah. And I'm not going to get like, spoiler, spoiler, but I think the setting was genius. I think yeah. it worked really well. Um, the, the cinematography was beautiful. I love the kind of the nature of it and the the kind of water and the trees and everything it looked really it looked really stylish yeah um and it was just like boiled it down to what the original's about Mm -hmm. you know and it just worked yeah it was fun just like a fun predator movie just kind of what you want yeah yeah and just out of the blue i I wasn't expecting it to be that good that good Yeah, yeah exactly um and then we watched x 
Um, I think, did it come out beginning of this year? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, Ty West's um, horror film set in the 70s. Um, and I really loved it. It's yeah. got elements of Psycho, elements of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Friday the 13th, like all these kind of horror staples kind of all rolled together into something a little bit different. Um, the characters are great. I mean, you know, everyone's talking about Mia. Um, is it Mia Goth, I think? I think so, yeah. Um, everyone's talking about her performance. Um, she is really good. But as a whole, it just it just worked. It had that feeling of, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre in terms of it's shot pretty low budget in kind of one location. Yeah. And it just kind of amps up and up and up and up, you know. Um, and it was a it's a surprise. I really, really liked it. And I'm looking forward to seeing Pearl. Because I think yeah. it's just finishing its cinema run. Yeah. So it will be out on um, streaming and stuff soon. Yeah, I'm excited um, to see both. I might uh I'm sure we're gonna have a few horror movie nights this month, so I'll try to suggest yeah. it one of those nights and get yeah. people to watch it. I know that you're again, my Texas theater kind of new obsession, but I think they're showing them double bill. I saw that today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Honestly, this month there's about like ten things that I would be like, Yeah, I wanna go to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I mean I'm I'm in Dallas every once in a while, but I'm mainly yeah. in Houston right now. So I wish, I think they're they're renovating one an old theater down there, uh, but I, I don't know. I haven't really found my my place yeah. down there yet. But yeah. I've, I've only been down there a little while. So mm. yeah, it's hard, isn't it? You never know whether it's just going to be a old place that's showing like new films, or if it's going to be someone that really cares about film. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, but I did watch a couple of um, like new releases. Mm-hmm. Um, so I watched Don't Worry Darling in the cinema. Yeah. Um, the highly talked about Olivia Wilde film yeah. um, with Florence Pugh and Harry Styles. Um, I think I think the ideas start off really interesting. Um, I'm trying not to talk about Harry Styles because he's not very good, but the ideas start off really interesting and it just fizzles. There doesn't seem to be kind of, I don't know, it never kind of pays off in a satisfying way for me. Yeah. You know, because I must admit for, you know, 75% of the film, I was like, okay, where is this going? You know, this is kind of interesting. What are they going to do? Um, yeah. And then when it finally gets to the end, you're a bit like, oh. That's that's what they chose, you know. That's the yeah. that's the direction they went after all that. Um, Florence Pugh's incredible, you know. Chris Pine plays a really good kind of creepy semi villain, I guess. He's you know it's hard to yeah put him as the villain, but um, which is a new kind of role for him. It's just it's just a bit bland in the end. It's not satisfying at all. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, it, especially putting all that time and money into a film to not like stick the landing. I haven't seen yeah. it, but I mean, yeah. um, especially with all the hype that is getting yeah. and all the controversy and stuff, it's like at least, I don't know. I know it's hard to make a good movie. Yeah. But, yeah, it is. Know. Yeah. But you, I mean, we know that they go through, you know, loads and loads of script rewrites and kind of looking yeah. it over and seeing, and I just can't believe that this is the best that they could come up with. Yeah. That you know, this is what was greenlit. Yeah. Yeah. And the last film I'm going to talk about just to get through it quickly is uh, a film called Funny Pages, um, directed by Owen Klein, who was um, the young boy in Noah Baumbach's film. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, this is. Which his, film? The Squid and the Whale. Okay. Sorry. Um, so this is his like kind of feature film debut, I think. Um, and he's only about 24 mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, and he's like a up and coming, not really up and coming. He, he's aspiring to be a comic book artist, um, but more kind of the underground comics um, and kind of reaches this crossroads in his life where he takes one direction. Um, and the trailer looks really interesting. It's kind of like the indie vibe that I kind of get drawn towards. Um, I hated it. I thought yeah. it was just the most mean-spirited 
film. All the characters were just horrible to each other for no reason. Yeah. And I could tell that they were going for that kind of quirky, you know, I don't I don't know how to I don't know if they were purposefully supposed to be horrible or whether they just missed time like miscalculated some of the acting yeah from the people but it just like the whole way through I was like I I don't like anyone in this film there's no one that I can like gravitate towards yeah you know um and it was a real shame cuz I thought it was going to be really good you know from the yeah. trailer and stuff it was one that I kind of see, like sort out yeah, I'm um, kind of surprised too because I I remember reading about the film and I put it on yeah. my watch list recently because it sounded really good. I think it's doing like some big festivals, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I know that like from Letterbox, at least a lot of people really liked it, and you know they're calling it kind of like the male Ladybird, um, hmm. and you know how much I love Ladybird. Yeah, it's kind of one of my fa- you know favorite films from recent years, and not once did it cross my mind that it was anything like that. I was just like, this is just not working yeah Yeah. it's just not working for me um which is a shame you know and maybe maybe that's what they were trying to go for you know because he is from um a privileged background so maybe they were like i don't shine a light on that i don't know but Hmm. it just didn't work at all for me um, yeah which was a real shame oh well yeah there's always another film to watch that's gonna work so yeah (laughs) just chalk that one down to a loss (laughs) Uh, what have you been watching, dude? <clears throat> oh, yeah, me. I forgot. I was like about to go on to Creep Show. Uh, so I've watched a few things. Uh, one of them was The Black Phone, which I yeah. tried to go see it in theaters. It only just left like a month ago or so. Yeah. I mean, it was doing, it did pretty well, I think, this summer. Uh, but The Black Phone, it's got Ethan Hawke in it. Um, and uh, it's, I think it's on Hulu now. Mm. I think uh, yeah. it, it's on one of the streaming services. So we found it and watched it one night because we were wanting to watch something horror esque, and uh, and it was really good. Um, Ethan Hawke is is amazing. It's it's kind of um, it's the closest thing I could equate it to is maybe Stranger Things as far as the the feel and tone. And stuff, yeah. but it's kind of does some horror genre mixing, which is mm. fun. Um, and I guess kind of Stranger Things does that too. But and it also takes place in the seventies, I think. So it's a period piece. Yeah. Um, but it was a really good story, very well executed. The director, I believe, directed the first Doctor Strange, and I think Sinister is that the other the other horror movie that Ethan Hawke is in. I um, think so. that does ring a bell, yeah, yeah, without kind of looking. Yeah, I think uh, he directed those those two films, and then obviously he got kicked off of Doctor Strange 2, and he went back to kind of doing what he loves, yeah. with horror stuff. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it was really good, uh, and I, I found out today that the – short story that it's based on was actually written by joe hill which is stephen king's son who's also yeah. in the movie that we're talking about <laughs> later uh, i was like oh shit like that's kind of yeah. crazy um <clears throat> but yeah so i i highly recommend it very good like up-to-date horror film sweet um and heathen hawk is always great um yeah and then also with all the talk of uh, Brendan Fraser lately um, mm. in his new film, film uh, The Whale, I think it is. Yeah. Um, we uh, went and watched or put on The Mummy, um, the original, well, not original, original, but the, the first Brendan Fraser one, which is, I think, 1999. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's fun. It, it's a it's a fun it's it holds up pretty well. Um, I mean the effects are uh, you know not as great in some of the shots, yeah. but the the little bug creatures still work really well as a CGI effect, and they're still. Yeah. I mean, I remember that being so. I was just going to say, yeah, they the fact that they went under the skin, and you could see them crawl around. Yeah, scared me to death. Yeah, yeah, same here. Um, and Brendan Fraser's performance, it's interesting. In retrospect. Like, 
of all the things that have come after, and I guess some of the things mm. that came before, but he's very in in that movie. He's very much a kind of Indiana Jones, like Harrison Ford, yeah. um, Chris Pratt kind of hero. You mm-hmm. know, um, I, I there's so many action stars like that. They just you know nail that role so well and, and yeah. he do, he he hits it like really well um and uh yeah it's it's a fun movie and i'm sure if you're a brendan fraser fan you know yeah. you've seen it a million times we are going to um, go back to it soon i keep mentioning it cuz uh chelsea and i really like it so we're, yeah. we're looking for the reason to go back soon yeah and kind of watch the first two at least yeah yeah i don't know if i'll watch any more <laughs> yeah. after the first one but um i mean i i enjoy the films but they were never like my franchise or anything yeah. like that yeah. you know what i mean so yeah um but yeah and then the other film that i watched was uh licorice pizza uh oh, it was nice. a rewatch um i had seen it of course earlier this year when it was out in cinemas mm-hmm. and um yeah, it, it's still a five out of five for me. The film is really, awesome. really good. I mean, the performances yeah. are amazing. The storytelling is really good. I think I might not go back to it again for a while, though, because it's um, the film works so well the first time you watch it, I think. Mm. Um, and And then going back to it, it's just already knowing the story, yeah. you know, it, it, I, I didn't get anything new out of it really, which is kind of surprising. It's usually the opposite. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it just works so well, you know, you think the joy comes more from the like surprises. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and not really knowing where it's going and, mm. and especially the tension, the, the tension of, uh, the, the whole sequence with Bradley Cooper. Yeah. Oh, it's so good like the first time you watch it because it's just you're just on the edge of your seat yeah um and it's still great i mean it's obviously it's it's a great movie um mm. but it's i think it's one that i want to kind of like maybe forget about for a little while and then go back and watch it again yeah to, to enjoy it again you know what i mean yeah because it's, it's it's up on streaming now isn't it um yeah i think it was on cause... prime yeah, because I keep seeing it, and I'm, you know, I'm tempted to go back and watch it as well. Because it was, I mean, it is great. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe give it a little bit more time. Yeah, till I forget bits. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, lose a few more brain cells. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was it for me, man. So awesome. Some good ones. Yes, on to Creep Show. Ladies and gentlemen, from 1982, uh, Letterboxd summarizes the film. Well, the tagline for the film is the most fun you'll ever have being scared. <laughs> um, and the the summary is inspired by the EC comics of, 1950- of the 1950s. George A. Romero and Stephen King bring five tales of terror to the screen. So, yeah, like I said, um, my dad... Uh, brings this film up every once in a while and it particularly the um the last story uh mm. they're creeping up on you um because i think it just creeped him out yeah and uh, understandably it's it's uh i mean i don't know there's a few people out there that might enjoy bugs but most people <laughs> yeah are yeah. creeped out um and it sound i mean the way that he kind of described it it just sounded so familiar like something maybe i had seen before but like i said when i when i watched it realized oh i i, I don't think i've seen any of this yeah um but uh yeah i mean just just kind of went into a cold i didn't know it was going to be an anthology um and a lot of it surprised me, and uh, I, of course I love Ramiro. You know, yeah. Night of the Living Dead, yeah. Dawn of the Dead. Um, you know, he's the the father of the zombie film, mm-hmm. and so I I expected that I was going to enjoy it a lot, but I also didn't know what to expect. Yeah. Um, 
where were you coming at going into this film? What was your expectation or had you heard anything about the film? So I didn't know anything about any of the segments. Um, I, I recognized the, is it like the, the typeface for creep show? Uh-huh. I know this sounds really strange and the ghoul that's on the poster. Yeah. I feel like they, those two together are very um, recognizable and yeah. kind of slightly iconic. Um, but I didn't know until I kind of started to research that it was an anthology. Um, yeah. All written by Stephen King. They were two things that kind of caught me off guard. Um, and directed by Romero. You know, yeah. of, <laughs> all of those things kind of seemed a little bit like I should know it, you know. Um, I love Stephen King. I've read a lot of his like books and um, really enjoy his work. Um, and I think that some of the best horror films are adapted from his work. So yeah. I, when I kind of found that out, I was very, very excited to kind of jump in and, and see um, what he what he can do. Because um, if I do have one criticism, it's that sometimes Stephen King doesn't know how to end a book. So I was hoping <laughs> with them being vignettes, it would be a little bit, I don't know, tighter, I guess. Yeah. The ending would be good. So I was excited to see. You know, and this is me being very critical of someone that's an incredible artist. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. For but sure. I was, yeah, I was stoked to kind of go in and just see um, these little segments. You know, yeah, um, and it didn't disappoint. It's uh, it's a, it's a fun time. You know, yeah. And each one is brisk. It feels like you're just getting started, and then it's kind of the end onto the next one. Yeah, yeah. I. Um... Yeah, I had a lot of fun watching it. I've, I've, I feel like I'm going to, um, like I'm really. I watched it by myself for for you mm-hmm. know to record the podcast and stuff, but I really am excited to show this to a group of people. Maybe that yeah. come that are coming over or something and uh, wanting to watch a horror film. Yeah, that haven't heard of this or seen it or or something like that because I feel like this is. It's kind of the perfect Halloween movie night movie, hmm. in my opinion, because yeah. it's um, there's kind of something for everybody, almost. You know, if if people aren't really into it, it's yeah. over quick, and it uh, like you said, on to the next one. It doesn't take itself too seriously, yeah. Either, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's get into the segments a little bit. Yeah. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through each segment chronologically and just kind of <clears throat> share some of our thoughts because they're, they're a bit thematically kind of all over the place. You know? Yeah. So yeah. it's going to be hard to talk about this film as a whole away from each segment. I do want to talk about the film as a whole, though, at yeah. the end because I, I want to see if we can see any uh, through lines of themes. Yeah. Mm. Um, but, yeah, we'll get to that. So, so there is a prologue and an epilogue and then there's like five stories. Yeah. Um, the prologue, you know, it, it starts off and this kid is reading this, or he his dad has found the comic book. He's like getting onto his kid for reading this comic and he thinks it's trash. And um, the kid is played by Joe Hill, which is Stephen King's son. Yeah. I'm not sure at what point he changed his name. Mm. Um, or Probably why. just to, you know, Separate Break out his own a little bit, yeah. yeah. It's weird that he picked the name Hill. It's like King of the Hill. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was it, yeah. Yeah, some inside joke or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it starts off with a kid, and he's like, he's a good little actor. And and mm. it just, it, it sets the tone, I feel like, for the film, because it's, um, I don't know, it's just so dark. Right off the bat, yeah. I mean, the dad is like obviously an abuser. Yeah, you know, and um, and you don't really know what to expect. And then this kid is like sitting in bed, sees this floating skeleton in his outside his window, and he's like happy. Yeah, it's like oh, it's my friend. <laughs> um. Yeah, and and it also like sets the tone as like a good Halloween movie because there's yeah. the, you know, the pumpkin. The shot of the pumpkin is like the opening shot of the film. Mm. Um. Yeah. So how how were you feeling when the when this prologue started? 
Um, yeah, I was just kind of intrigued as to where it was going to go. I knew, like I said, I knew that it was going to be an anthology um, before I started watching it. Um, and when it kind of started with the epilogue, uh, I was intrigued, you know, to see kind of what it was setting us up for. Because yeah. normally that kind of thing sets the tone a little bit, which it does. You know, as you said, it kind of sets up um, a lot of the things that we're going to see later on in the segments. Well, yeah, and then surprisingly, like when I was going back, I, I after watching it, I went back and watched the the prologue and the you know the quote that you you read at the beginning of our show hmm. is in the prologue, and the dad kind of lays out everything you're about to see. Yeah, like he's like. Things coming out of crates and eating people, dead people coming back to life, yeah. people turning into weeds. Like yeah. he, you'd miss it, you know, the, mm. on your first watch because you don't know what you're about to get into. But it's like, oh, that's that's everything you're about to yeah. see right there. <laughs> yeah, um, and then we kind of get sucked into the comic book. It kind of takes us yeah. through the stories that the boy was reading, um, one by one, starting with Father's Day. Yeah. Um, um, which also, also the opening credits I love, like the yeah. whole animation and that the music. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's like I don't know. It's it it's the kind. It's obviously the kind of animation like you don't get anymore. So there's like this cool nostalgia for this. Yeah, old school hand drawn animation stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then we get into Father's Day. Yeah, and before we get like in in in, did you? Um... Notice the the link to Rebecca in this segment. <laughs> yes. So, well, the the lady's name is Mrs. Danvers. Yeah. Is that is there any more than that? I or don't think there's any more than that. But when she was kind of running through the house, shouting "Mrs. Danvers, Mrs. Danvers," yeah. I was like, "No, no, where, uh, where are we?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wrote that down. I was like, "Mrs. Danvers, she's here." Um, <laughs> Yeah, Mrs. If if the listeners don't know, Mrs. Danvers is a a character in Alfred Hitchcock's film, uh, best winning picture, Rebecca. Yeah. Um, and you can go hear us talk all about that in one of our previous episodes. Yeah, um, but that was the first thing that I wanted. To do. I just I just didn't want to forget that um, Mrs. Danvers was in it back yeah. from the flames. Yeah. Um, so this segment. Um, the the standout thing to me at first was Ed Harris. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, whoa, there's Ed Harris and he's like super young and Yeah. He's gotten really not nice bristled. hair. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um and this is not the actually the first film that he did with George Romero. Uh he did a film before this, I think Night Riders. Um and uh yeah, so that's that's a film I haven't seen that I would like to go back and watch because like having someone, I feel like Romero is not someone you kind of equate to big name actors. No, you know most of his films are yeah. kind of unknowns, and he, I think he likes to do it that way. I mean, he talks about this in the behind the scenes on Creep Show that um, he likes to find act or it's better when a horror film has unknown actors because you don't have any expectation. You know, yeah. You're not you, sure who's going to survive. Kind of yeah, thing. exactly. Yeah. Um, but they kind of decided to go a different way with this. That yeah. um, kind of bigger name people would be, would be better um, for these short stories. Yeah. Um, which a lot of the people, I mean, I guess are pretty famous. You might know some of them more than me. Um, I didn't recognize a lot of them, but Ed Harris is is yeah. someone that I know pretty well. Um, and uh, ironically, my uh, great aunt actually went to um, drama school with him. Oh wow! At That's the awesome. University of Oklahoma, but she has no memory of it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so must have been like, a real good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like her son. Um, like figured it out one day like you know he's also a big theater person yeah. and and uh and he uh yeah figured out that they were went to school at the same time and and were in the same productions together wow. and was like hey, mom like you went yeah. to school with ed harris like do you you've never told me about this and like it's sh keep showing her pictures of, of of him and stuff and she's like i don't 
remember him. <laughs> 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 but maybe uh, maybe if we show her this film, she might yeah. might look a little more familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this film, uh, this uh, story, the Father's Day, um, mm. it was a lot of fun. I feel like. I, yeah, I was going to say, I think this is the best blend of the horror and comedy Yeah. Um, for, from all of them. Because I know this is kind of touted as, you know, a, a comedy horror. Yeah. In some ways, there's some funny elements. But um, there's just something about a corpse, d- like, killing people, screaming, where's my cake, that just tickled <laughs> me. Um, yeah. It's, it's, incred- it's very funny. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, and and then parts of it just like surprised me, you know, like yeah, uh, I don't know. I almost expected this film to be um, more cheesy, I guess. Yeah, and, and yeah. especially because it's like low budget, mm. you know. So I expected maybe some of the effects to not be as great, or or be cheesy in some way, be homemade ish, yeah. or some of the performances to be um, to be cheesy wooden yeah yeah wooden or or yeah. some, or you know like the like the actors weren't taking it seriously but mm-hmm. i feel like everybody sold it really well and then and the scene with like um uh i, I don't know the actress's name the uh there's so many people in this movie <laughs> but the uh, you know the bedelia i guess you know the character yeah. Like she's really sells that scene when she's like sitting in front of the grave drunkenly yeah. yelling at her father's grave and then yeah. he just like comes out and there's like maggots in his face <laughs> and like and then the um you know when Ed Harris goes out to the grave and he like falls into it mm. and then he starts trying to get up and then it, the stone is like about to fall on him. Yeah. And then the I guess Bedelia's body like comes out and like grabs him really quick like yeah all those little moments um got kind of frightening you know yeah yeah um which was which was really interesting you know i like like i said i expected it to be a little cheesier but it was like building the tension really well yeah and then when he uh (laughs) when he finally goes into the house and (laughs) He's like, where's my cake? And then he just like twists the lady's neck and breaks her <laughs> neck. Just caught me so off guard. Um, and it's like moments like that that I'm kind of excited to watch this with, you know, a group of people. One yeah. Night, you know, because yeah. I feel like it just. I, I mean, obviously, they got to like tie the story up really quick. So they're just like, mm-hmm. yeah, he just like breaks her neck and moves on. and <laughs> And then I guess rips her head off because he makes his yeah. cake. He does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it that might actually be my favorite of the stories. Oh, really? The Father's Day one. Yeah. So yeah, far. it is a strong one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, mine's coming up. I think that I, I was thinking long and hard about which one would be like my favorite. Yeah. Um, Mine's coming up. Okay, cool. So next we have The Lonesome Death of Gordy Veril. Veril? Yeah. Is it Gordy or Jordy? I might, uh, I think it's. I mean, it's spelled with a it, J. Yeah, but everyone, I think everyone, I, I've heard Stephen King pronounce it Gordy. Yeah. I think it's just spelled weird. Mm, yeah. Uh, um. But yeah, so this is a little bit of a. Um, bottle um, segment in terms of it just happens with one character in one house. Yeah. Um, and I think, and that character is Stephen King. Yeah. And I had no idea that that was Stephen King no. until I finished the film. And, <laughs> yeah. And then was looking up the actors. I, I felt like he looked really familiar. Yeah. Yeah. And, and almost looked kind of like, um, I, like Zac Efron or something like, mm. <laughs> you know? Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I had no idea it was him. Well, so he didn't, you didn't twig that it was a author acting. No. Instead of an actor <laughs> acting. <laughs> I mean, no, because I, I, like I said, it's like, I 
especially with like horror films and low budget horror films, I always expect to there to be just, <laughs> yeah. you know, be yeah. be actors, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. BC actors, you know. Um, but I thought he did an amazing job. He you did. Know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, there was nothing about his performance that made me think like this guy has never acted before. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's such a like a just a small little vignette really in between um so an asteroid kind of hits on his farm and um Gordy Verrill is kind of a little um less I don't know intelligent than the normal person <laughs> I, I uh-huh. should say um and the the thing from inside the media kind of follows or gets inside his house and slowly turns everything including him into like like a moss grass substance until he kind of disintegrates. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's just the kind of him accidentally touching things and then touching himself and just slowly becoming more and more moss like, mm-hmm. you know, some really great uh, makeup Yeah. in this one. And, and set you know, design. Like, I mean, they had yeah. to put those plants all over everything. Yeah. Not down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and his just his whole perf- like his performance is just so wacky and funny yeah and uh and then there's the whole f- like imaginary sequence where he's like i wonder what they'd pay for it at the college yeah. and the guy's <laughs> and like the- offering him two hundred dollars <laughs> and he thinks that's just like so much yeah. money <laughs> And then, and then he, and then the meteor breaks, and he gets another uh, imaginary sequence where the guy's yeah. like, "It's worth nothing." Yeah, two hundred dollars <laughs> for a broken meteor. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then it gets. I mean, I, as as with anything horror or Stephen King, mm. you expect things to get pretty dark, and it gets really dark. Yeah, at the end. Yeah. Um. Because the only way out is to kill himself. It is, yeah. Um, um, which he does. Yeah. But as a grass person. Yes. So it kind of takes you out until the blood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're kind of like, oh, cool, that, that hill has got a shot. Oh, wait, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, um, like, it the, the behind-the-scenes stuff on this thing is really cool. There's a, a documentary about the film I think made in 2007 called just desserts. Mm. Um, you can find it on YouTube. Um, but, but yeah, the detail that they went into, I mean, they they had to make that whole moss thing, like put it all over everything, make the costume, uh, especially for the end, you know, when he does shoot himself, they had to like make it explode and like make it safe for the person that was like in it. Yeah. Um and apparently every time they would uh blow the head off it would catch on fire. <laughs> so they had to do it like three times. Wow. Um and then also another crazy thing is uh the, apparently there was like a local airport closer there or like a pri- I don't know. It wasn't like a big airport but like a, yeah. kind of like a smaller private airport. Yeah. Um but pilots would fly over that um you know, kind of field or whatever, where they built the house and put all the moss and stuff. And uh, it would, like, throw them off because that was, like, a landmark to know that they were getting close to the airport. And then all of a sudden they start flying over and there's a house there that looks like it's been there for 100 years with, like, (laughs) moss all over it. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, it's just kind of funny. Wow. That's dead interesting. Um. I mean, there's not a lot to say about this one. Yeah, it's kind I of... mean, it's pretty. It's pretty short. I I do have more I want to say when we get to like talking about the film as a whole. But yeah, yeah, I feel like I was surprised that it didn't carry on in that vein. In terms of we get like a longer form story and then like a little standalone vignette. I thought that after the next one, um, the fourth out of the five would be another like you know five ten minutes like that. Yeah, or it's just a little story until leading into a big one. But yeah, um, that was the only one of, of that's like that, you know, apart yeah. from the end one, really. 
<clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, it, and it and it is, but it's kind of nice. It's like you know they're all very different. You don't know, yeah. especially with starting off with those two. Um, you have no idea what to expect next. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and next we get something to tide you over, which is a curveball. Yeah. Again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <coughs> Leslie Nielsen, um, Ted Danson. Yeah. And. Gay, is it Galen Ross? Yeah, that's her. Mm. So, um, yeah, and it's kind of like, you know, different setting, you know, this kind of nice house that, um, I guess it starts off with, with Ted Danson, right? It does, yeah. 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 Um, which I don't know, Ted, when I watched, you know, watched the film, yeah. I, I, I didn't know him from that much, I guess the you know, his big thing was cheers right after mm. this. Um, and, uh, but we did just start watching. Well, Sarah's been a big fan of the good place. I don't know if you've yeah. ever seen it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I'm, I am now a fan of the good place. Um, we've been kind of binge watching it. We're on season two now and he's really, really good in that. So it's kind of fun yeah. to be like, to have watched this kind of the same time. Yeah. Um, and then Leslie Nielsen, like I know a lot of people know him from Airplane, Airplane. and the Naked Gun. Yeah. Um and I think I've probably seen Airplane maybe, like as a kid or something, but yeah. um I always knew him from Mr. Magoo. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> and he's always like it's always fun when he shows up, you know what I mean? It is. Yeah, when I saw his name kind of on the opening credits, I was like that's going to be the comedy, you know, mm. but it wasn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's kind of, he's very sinister and severe throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with Ted Danson, you know, being a, a huge fan of Frasier, I obviously, he shows up in a Frasier episode and you have to kind of be aware of his character from Cheers. Yeah. Um, not that I've ever watched it, but so it was cool to see a very, very young Ted Danson. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And everybody's great in it. You know, it's yeah. a very, um, like you said, sinister uh, story. I mean, mm -hmm. they all are, but, yeah. um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a very simple in a lot of ways, but also mm -hmm. just effed up. <laughs> yeah. I um, think this was my favorite segment. Really? Yeah. So why is that? you think i'm a i'm a huge fan of kind of like psychological horror you know yeah. and and i feel like stephen king does does that better than anybody else which is not really saying anything new um the there is a there's a book and a film um uh that he that he made um leslie's story um about a woman who gets ends up handcuffed to a bed in the middle of nowhere alone um and that is super freaky. And this just reminded me of that. It was that mm. kind of like, there's no way out. Yeah. You know, and this tide is coming in and you, you can't really save the person you really love. Yeah. You know? Um, and I feel like he does that so well. I mean, the tension just built and built. You know, you, it was kind of like, okay, what is he doing? Yeah. Like, where is the wife? Oh, she's in the hole as well. He's going to have to watch her die. You know, it was just kind of just kept amping up. Until the end when it was like, okay, this is just taking a complete left turn. And mm -hmm. it's a very satisfying ending. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, you get these like moss, um, seaweed zombies. Yeah. Ocean zombies. Yeah, his wife and her lover, Ted Danson, that he pretty much drowned mm -hmm. on the beach. Um, come back to, to get him. Yeah. Um. And yeah. and then the and then the, the those last shots of Leslie, like being f like screaming, and freaking out, yeah, caught me off guard too because I was I don't think I've ever seen a performance like that from him. Yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. It's very different. Yeah, yeah, and he looks genuine, genuinely terrified. Yeah, you know. <laughs> um. Yeah, and I always love it when there's films from like the the eighties and nineties that that show high tech things 
the oh, yeah. like his house, mm-hmm. and I was just like, it's so dated now. But I just love to watch it and just you know what was considered high tech. Yeah, he had all these security cameras and uh, and know, all the could... the TVs and the VCR yeah. that he like brings out to the to yeah, the water, exactly. and and also at the beginning he's like trying to give Ted Danson tips on his TV mm. signal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, yeah. Apparently, Leslie was, you know, just super goofy on the set. Like, had a fart I machine bet. with him. Would <laughs> 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 just use it all the time. Um, and I, I guess... do recommend watching um, Airplane. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. It's. It, I mean, it still holds up. You yeah. know, some jokes are a little bit dated, but I mean, I always hear about it. Like, I, I yeah. mean it. You know, I watch a lot of like comedy stuff and, and yeah. comedi- comedian stand up and you know, behind the scenes stuff, and everybody always talks about that movie, yeah. Um, but apparently, this was uh, at the time in 1982, this was kind of pre Leslie uh, Nielsen being known for comedy, yeah. Um, th- that that all kind of came after this, but apparently, on the set, he was still, you know. Hilarious, yeah. Because the Naked Gun films came like later in the eighties. Yeah, Airplane had already happened, I think. But yeah, Naked Gun was eighty eight. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously Ted Danson, like you said, Silla to do Cheers. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So this is all. I mean, they're all kind of known, but this yeah. is like. Some of it is very pre, pre predates that, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is cool. It's cool that they, you know, I mean, they didn't pick unknowns necessarily, but they they pick the right people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, it yeah, it's one of those things where I think in hind like in hindsight they got it right because the the younger cast you kind of. No, you know, obviously when we get to the crate, you know, it's kind of more older people, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm not as familiar with those, I don't think, as, you know, people that we've seen recently or yeah. who are still acting. Um, but yeah, I mean, they get it right. You know, there's obviously the casting was like spot on to find these people. Yeah. Um. And it just, it just makes it like just has that extra layer of the enjoyment, you know. If there's someone, like you said in the Father's Day segment, when um, Ed Harris shows up, you're like, "Oh, cool! Here we go!" You know, yeah. I know that guy. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's fun to, to kind of hitch your wagon to to someone that you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is this was my favorite segment. I think um, the, the the horror side of it was a little bit different to the other ones, apart from the ending, where it does go full kind of um comic book horror yeah um but yeah it was it was a lot of not really fun but a bit more psychological which i enjoyed yeah um and then that leads us on to the crate which is the second to last segment um and the longest and and the longest yeah Yeah. and the most interesting Mm -hmm. i think that um there's a lot of layers to it yeah yeah definitely i I really like the premise of it um so uh they find a crate that was kind of forgotten about in a in a university college under some stairs um and when they pull it out and open it up it held it holds what like a yeti yeah like a tasmanian devil kind of like yeah uh yeah just otherworldly or just ancient creature yeah, that starts tearing people up and <laughs> yeah. devouring them and um, and stuff. And, and and the backdrop to this is a very very unhappy marriage. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. We've got kind of gets into woven. We've got Hal Hallbrook, Adrian yeah. Barbu, and uh, Fritz Weaver, kind of the three mains mm-hmm. in this. And um, I don't know any of them really. Uh, yeah. Like it, it seemed like um, in the behind the scenes stuff, like they were pretty big. Um, yeah, Adrian Barbu uh, was married to um, 
John Carpenter at one point. Mm. Maybe she was still married to him when they were making this film. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's you know a very unhappy marriage, and then you also have this like kind of predator guy. Yeah, that's like friends yeah. with the guy that's in the unhappy marriage. Yeah, um, I think it does a really good job of interweaving and kind of having payoffs because mm-hmm. at the beginning there's kind of a prolonged, um, like party kind of cocktail reception scene where we're getting to meet some of the characters and uh, and you know he goes across to the the predator type character and he's like I guess we're not playing chess tonight yeah and, you know and then that pays off later when you know, he tells his wife that he's had to cover for him before, mm-hmm. you know, so it's obviously something that he's done regularly. Yeah. Is cover for him to kind of try and help him clean up messes and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, I think it's a really well crafted story. Yeah. Um, and then there's obviously the, the, <laughs> the creature, yeah. um, which is, which is pretty scary. I mean, yeah. I was thinking, you know, because I know that you said that you haven't seen it, but when I was watching it, you know, when you kind of picked this film, you said that you thought that you had seen it mm-hmm. and it kind of like imprinted on you. And I was like, I feel like this is a, a gateway into more serious horror for like, I don't know, preteens. Yeah. Um, it's the kind of thing where it is spooky. I mean, to us, it's not. You can just tell it's like, a man in a suit you know yeah yeah um but i can imagine watching this as a younger it would have terrified oh yeah yeah like really really scared me um yeah. you know so it, it's kind of that borderline between and i guess that's why it's comedy horror is not you know it's, i don't know who you would i don't know who it's kind of advertised for yeah you know? Yeah, because it's a very comic book i mean obviously the whole thing is like comic yeah. book theme that's trying to be it's trying to Capture, capture the feel yeah. of a comic book i mean that was the whole inspiration was the ec comics which apparently were like um very kind of graphically disturbing and violent comic yeah. books um back in the day and um yeah just trying to capture that feeling i think you know i mean i think it's just geared towards just just horror fans but also just like those mm. people that that were their age that maybe read those comics so they were probably in their 30s or 40s at the time that yeah. this came out <clears throat> but i'm sure also younger audiences i mean obviously horror is always big with younger audiences too but mm-hmm. um i mean the creature is pretty freaky i mean they they did a really good job with it some of it's like they animatronic did. and stuff and they also they do they do a good job of like not showing you too much at first, I mean, you do yeah. get like quick little glimpses of the whole thing, but it's very yeah. quick. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also like the lighting changes a yeah. lot. You know, you get yeah. like this bright red and some blue, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and like a lot of smoke, and mm-hmm. it's it it it's got the feel of a of a carnival. You know, like you know when you go to kind of like a stage show, yeah. And this is how they kind of show you like it's it's scary you know yeah yeah when i put some fog and we change the lights a little bit Mm -hmm. um which i liked i think that for this it worked you know i can imagine in a comic book as well you'd flip the page and it would be you know red and like like real like it'd pop out at you kind of thing yeah yeah for sure um and then that that shot of you know when they're talking about oh he's in the bottom of the sea you know he'll never get out and then the shot of just like the eyes, yeah, is, I and probably the, maybe the scariest shot to me. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just, yeah, it's freaky. <laughs> yeah, he's, you know, I wonder because I know that there's a second one. I wonder if that is there's a continuation of this um, um, story because it, it's ripe for it. From what I got, everybody hates the second one. Oh, okay. <laughs> And I, I don't think uh, many of the same people had anything no. to do with it. No. Um, I mean, there's probably a, an audience out there that does love the second one. I'm sure. Um, yeah. But uh, I think maybe only one of the stories was based on a Stephen King story that almost mm. was in this first one. Um, okay. But but they do. There is a TV show now. There is. I think that's kind of. 
like where I first heard of this properly mm. was when because it's what like three seasons in now something like that yeah um, when that launched on Shudder yeah you know, it's like oh it's based on the on the like eighties film you yeah know? um which is the same as Twilight Zone it worked I think it worked really well as a anthology series yeah because mm-hmm. each episode like Black Mirror each episode could you know be something a bit different yeah exactly yeah uh, so. yeah um and I know there's a that that show has been doing well from what I've read like oh cool you know Good. the fans really like it and there's yeah. a lot of passion and love for the creation of it um they even put the ashtray in like almost every episode nice um which is something that they do in this film the ashtray yeah. that uh Bedelia uses to kill her father in the first um you know Father's Day sequence yeah. is in every every oh, one of awesome. these episodes yeah every one of that is it <clears throat> um you'd have to kind of maybe watch a YouTube video to find it all yeah but uh yeah it's there sometimes awesome. obvious sometimes not yeah yeah um but uh yeah, Adrian Barbu in this the crate sequence is yeah. really really great. <laughs> yeah, her performance yeah. and stuff, mm-hmm. and like it was crazy to me watching the behind the scenes stuff because she says she's never drank in her life before. Wow, wow, <laughs> she plays a drunk really well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. It's like, yeah, it's like how how how. <laughs> yeah <laughs> never being drunk before being able to be that convincing as a drunk oh she's probably been around a lot of drunk people though yeah but yeah <laughs> been in the industry yeah yeah um I, I feel like out of the five this is the the baggiest you know there was yeah. you could tell that they were trying to stretch it out just a little bit mm. you know yeah um but overall it works i think that on a rewatch it would probably work a little bit better you know yeah yeah Knowing where it was going and not as interested in the in the what's in the crate, you know. Yeah, just more. wanting to see more shots of the yeah of the thing. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah, um, but yeah, I think that it all of them kind of offer something a little bit different, and I did like the the classic. This reminded me more of like the classic Universal Monsters mm. um, type of horror film. You yeah. Know? <clears throat> um. Which I dug. I thought that it was a um, interesting kind of revamp up into the the eighties. Yeah. If that movie had been made today, like Frankenstein or Creature from the Black Lagoon, it would have been like that. You know, a lot of blood, yeah. a lot of people being horribly murdered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is probably the most gory, right? Yeah. Because it's well, at least in terms of blood. Yeah, definitely. It's like mopping up buckets of blood on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also the yeah. thing I didn't get, you know, the I guess maybe the one criticism with the with it story wise is like how would they not get caught mm-hmm. in the end anyway? Cuz there is yeah, yeah, okay, maybe there's no evidence of um you know, the monster, yeah. Yeah, the of the creature. monster or the or the creature killing them or whatever, but yeah. There's also no bodies like where you know, yeah. you think the police aren't going to be like, "Hey, where's your wife?" Yeah, and where's your protege that everyone knows you're going to go and meet that night yeah and all these people have just gone missing on the same night um and there's one connection which is these two guys yeah so we've been playing chess all night <laughs> yeah i've been having an affair with one of my students it wasn't me <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but i mean maybe i mean the creature broke out so maybe he kills them first anyway yeah yeah i guess he comes back and gets them yeah so yeah Godzilla type sequel. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then we get to the final. Yeah. They're creeping up on you. Yeah. And I love like the transitions between each of these two, where it's like it sh- it flicking through the pages. And- yeah, it it turns mm-hmm. back into a comic book. Yeah. It, like freeze frames turns back into its comic book. Pulls out of the panel, goes into a new panel. Um, mm it's a fun way to do it it is yeah and i think that that's you know it works as an anthology in that way if it was just like fade to black and then doom 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 yeah with the title you'd be like okay yeah 
but it it does feel like a like a, a whole piece of work then I think as opposed to like five separate stories it is a like there's a beginning and an end and this is the middle you know yeah yeah um but yes they're creeping up on you the uh the the final segment um and my least favorite I think <laughs> <laughs> and I think that the reason that it's my least favorite is because it's one of those that I feel have been taken and like imitated and you know we've seen it kind of reproduced so mm. much now. Yeah. Um and I know that it can't have been original at this point either but it does it does feel like it did feel like something I'd seen before. Yeah. And I was like okay it's just going to get overrun and die in this house yeah yeah these cockroaches you know um and i think that was a shame because um and obviously he's a horrible character so i kind of wanted him to die as well yeah. um but it was a shame because like i said it did have those like it was at times pretty funny and you know it could have been really creepy and i imagine yeah. if you've got a phobia of some kind of bugs then this would send you screaming out of the theater yeah yeah for sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, it it definitely creeped me out. I mean, I was ready for it to get over so quick, which it yeah. is pretty quick. It's only like ten minutes or so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just like kind of this despicable guy played by E. G. Marshall, and uh, yeah, I mean, it just starts off with him killing a roach, and then the yeah. you know, and he's like a neat freak and like a germaphobe, and and yeah, he just gets overrun with these these cockroaches to the point where like they're crawling out of his body at the end. Yeah. And it's yeah. just so disgusting. <laughs> yeah. It is. <laughs> um and apparently it was like one of the most expensive things on this film cuz each cockroach yeah. was like 50 cents. Yeah. And um there's mixed trivia out there. I don't know like so one piece of trivia says they had a 125 or they had 250,000 mm. cockroaches, which I don't think is true based on uh, other things that I've read. But because if it was 250,000 cockroaches, it would be like $125,000 just for the cockroaches. Yeah, wow. Um, but uh, in the behind the scenes stuff, it's pretty funny because it was the one sequence where it was it was pretty difficult to film because like they would you know plop the roaches down and they would all run yeah. away. Yeah, within seconds and like hide under stuff. Um, so it was hard to like. They had like ro cockroach wranglers, like trying to like, oh <laughs> you know, get them in the shots and yeah. stuff, which is kind of crazy going back because there's even a, sh a like a close up shot of like a cockroach peeking around the corner. Like, how did <laughs> yeah. they get that? <laughs> um, it's those cockroach wranglers. They're just so yeah. Talented. yeah. <laughs> um. But uh, but they said that also the crew, like as soon as they would like put the, like bring the cockroaches out, the crew would just scatter. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, there's no like, way to hey, control them though. Yeah. You can't like yeah. keep them on the set. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's definitely one of the most disturbing things to watch. I mean, especially, I mean, I don't know. Like I said in, earlier, I don't know anyone who... I mean, I know people that aren't afraid of bugs at all in any way, but, like, even those people, I can't see them being like, oh, I would love that. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of like a, it's a cruel way to end because, you know, we do get the, the epilogue, but you do come out kind of itching and scratching and kind of looking yeah. out for cockroaches because I think that if it had been put, say, if this had been, like, switched with the Lonesome Death of Geordie Vale, or Veril, sorry. Um, yeah, but see, it's like... It wouldn't have lasted in your mind, you know? Well, yeah, but also I, I, maybe that was the point. They wanted people yeah, to come out exactly. of the theater scratching and itching and, yeah. and whatnot. Leaving them a little present. Because if it had been earlier, then some people might have just left and not come back. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because it's very... like there's, there's prolonged shots of... It's kind of like they're in a tank. And they're just like piled on each other. Yeah. And like writhing around and it's very visceral. Yeah. You know. Um Yeah. It's, and that it's, that shot of them just like coming out of his body. Yeah. It's so gross. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> um oh, but he yeah. got what was coming to him. 
He sure did. What a nasty piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then that brings us to the epilogue, yeah. which you know we get back to Joe Hill mm-hmm. and um, his uh, father. I I don't remember. Do do they notice that the Oh, it's the trash guys, right? The trash yeah. guys find the comic book. Yeah, yeah and Tom do. Savini is one of the trash men, mm-hmm. which I, I don't know if you know Tom Savini, but he's uh, he pops up in everything. Like he pops up yeah. in any like all these old horror movies and stuff. Like he's in a lot of George Romero stuff. He's in some of Robert Rodriguez's films. Mm. Um, known for like horror effects, like he did yeah, all he... the effects for this film. Uh, he he kind of changed the, the surface of like, like gore on, mm-hmm. you know, on screen. Um, yeah, wasn't he part of Friday the Thirteenth as well? Probably, I'm. I'm I think, not sure. Yeah, like Kevin Bacon getting the arrow through his throat, uh, and all that kind of stuff. You know, the 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 deaths that stick with you. Yeah, um, is all down to him, I believe. He also trained Greg Nicotero, which is mm. a famous special effects guy does yeah. you know he he's do greg nicotero is one of the showrunners or or one of the main people doing the new creep show oh nice series okay. too so keeping um, it pretty in the family kind of thing yeah but then tom savini is also you know he always has all these cameos and sometimes bigger yeah. characters too so every time i see him i'm like oh there he is you know <laughs> and he's he's got a quick little part in this but he's he's really funny he's yeah it's like it's a comic book um but they noticed that uh the voodoo doll um coupon or whatever has been Mm. cut out Mm -hmm. of this thing and then we find out the kid has it and he's stabbing his (laughs) his dad in the (laughs) neck with needles um which is kind of satisfying i guess yeah for the end it's just that yeah it's it just ties it all together you know there's if you think about it, the the one thing missing from like watching a comic book is you don't get the the adverts and the you know the kind of yeah. the extra bits you know and they've kind of managed to add that in and um and just kind of give that little vignette at the end so yeah. it works really well. Now there's there's a uh, kind of two themes I feel like that do have a a through line. Uh, yeah. The main one, the main obvious one, I think, is uh, revenge. Yeah. These are kind yeah. of all revenge stories. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, with the the prologue and epilogue, the kid gets revenge on his dad. Um, yeah. Bedelia gets revenge on her father, but the father also gets revenge on Bedelia. Mm-hmm. Um, the... The one that I'm having the hardest time making a case for is the um, the Gordy one, the lonesome yeah. death of Gordy, because uh, it's just him. But I mean, you know, it's kind of revenge of the universe or yeah. revenge of the <laughs> of the meteor. Maybe got mad at him for yeah. calling their juice shit. Um, <laughs> Meteor shit. Um, <laughs> yeah, so kind of revenge of the the plants or the universe. Uh, and then the the Ted Danson one um, is, you know, Leslie Nielsen getting revenge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Or And then they also come back and get revenge yeah. on him. Um, uh, the crate is like the the husband... Yeah, you know, getting revenge yeah. on his wife for all the verbal abuse and embarrassment that he's gotten from having her at parties, yeah. uh, and then they're creeping up on you. Is I mean, like, sort of revenge of the cockroaches, I guess. But, um, but I mean, you, it's like the the why you know there's the whole phone call with the wife like the of the wife of the guy who committed suicide because of this guy yeah. you know so she it's almost like she gets her revenge or something yeah and there's all there's you know tied into that revenge theme there is also the people getting what they deserve in the end yeah you know um 
not so again, not so much gaudy, I guess, but something to tide you over. Leslie Nielsen gets what he deserves. Yeah. The crate, the not quite say they get what they deserve, but the wife, you're kinda of like, Oh thank goodness she's you know, we don't have to hear her screeching anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and they're creeping up on you. It's the same, like he he gets what he deserves in the end. It's like yeah. his biggest fear realized. Yeah. You know? Um yeah, yeah. There's and, definitely like like connections between all of them. It's not okay. Here's something completely different. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I was trying to figure out if, if there was a, a central theme was the theme of like fathers. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, fathers, fathers keep Day, obviously. Well, yeah, Father's Day, but also you know there's like the abusive father in the mm-hmm. the prologue, and then there in the Gordy one, his father sh- shows up in the mirror. Yeah. Um. And then, uh, but then, like, the something to tide you over, and like the other ones, not, I, I can't, yeah, couldn't really too. find anything hmm. there. But you know, I don't, I don't think these things were necessarily done on purpose, but it is interesting to like yeah, kind of see. Think, yeah, there's definitely, I think, quite a lot of it as well as just Stephen King, like the things that interest him come out, yeah, as well. You know, his books are just full of like people abusive marriages and and like i don't know absent fathers or abusive fathers and you know there's yeah. a lot of like obviously um like horror which is what he's known for but the horror normally comes from like people being horrible to each other yeah you know and the the you know the um the thing from the crate or um the meteor is just used to highlight that yeah yeah um but yeah, it works. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's uh, that's creep show. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing. Um, apparently, this was George Romero's only number one "quote unquote" film for one week. Oh man! As far as like opening, you know, yeah, yeah, and and having a number one film, which. Uh, is a shame, but I mean, it is. People, yeah, people know who he is. They they should go back and watch all of his stuff. He was That's making right. films every, right up till the end. Every time I watch Night of the Living Dead, I just cannot believe just how brilliant that film is mm-hmm. in terms of horror and just American society as a whole. Yeah, it's got the uh, it's got one of the most devastating endings to a film I've ever seen. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's phenomenal. Yeah. The ending's not phenomenal, but the film as a whole is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I just needed to get my night that every time I talk about Romero, I'm like, I need to talk about Night of the Living Dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing, dude. It's, it is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's a great filmmaker. Yeah. Coming out on 4K soon, I think, from Criterion. Oh, sweet. I'm going to have to get it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. I think that's all I have. For yeah, me show. too. I mean, it. Yeah, it's. Uh, it. I feel like it's a film that you're not going to get anymore. With the mm-hmm. rise of TV, it's such a singular experience. You yeah, know, these anthology films just don't happen anymore. Yeah. Um. So it's really. It's just. It. Yeah. It's nice to watch something like this. That's a little bit different. Yeah. It, I mean, especially like theater releases for anthology yeah. films. I don't think we'll ever get something like this again no exactly yeah um i don't think anyone would i know that the budget wasn't very but very big but nobody would put the money in for it to go into the theater yeah you know that's the thing it's like you might see a film like this pop up on netflix but yeah it's you're not gonna yeah it's not gonna be the caliber of people involved yeah you know it's it's an example of a bygone era Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) So let's guess what each of us rated this on Letterboxd. We yeah. do we do this at the end of each episode where we try to guess. And uh, on Letterboxd, we rate it um, out of five stars. So mm. I've got I've got two in mind, and I don't know whether to go like ambitious or like pessimistic. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm gonna say. 
you rated this three and a half. All right. I'm going to say you rated this two and a half. I was going to say three, but. Yeah. Since you, you were in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I give it four out of five. I gave it three and a half out of five. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, By my little letterbox ranking system. Yeah. Um, I read what I put for a freestyle film and I was like, no, I think it's better than that. Yeah. You know. Um, So, yeah, three and a half. But four, that's great. Yeah. I mean, my gut feeling was three for you, but uh, yeah. because you said three and a half for me, I went lower because I was mm. like, because usually, I don't know, I feel like I rate things averagely higher mm. than you do sometimes. Yeah, I think that it just it just worked. You know, there were some bits that just didn't quite work, but I'm also I'm looking at it from what forty years later. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, some things aren't quite gonna work now. Yeah. Yeah. But at the time, you know, it, it was an enjoyable two hours. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. 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 It was great. Yeah. So continuing with our Darnish Horror Month, <laughs> what are we watching next week? Now, I um, did not know that this would be so related to the film that we watched this week when I yeah. picked it. I, I picked it before I'd watched Creep Show, um, before I I knew that you had picked Creep Show. Yeah. Um, and what I'm doing, I had a look for a director that I really liked and picked a film that I hadn't seen of his that's kind of like horror related. Um, the director I picked was John Carpenter. Ah. Um, and the film that we're going to be watching next week is The Fog from oh, okay. 1980, starring Adrian Barbio, Barbio and yeah. Hal Holbrook. Ah, interesting. Um, with oh, wow. Jamie Lee Curtis, Janet Lee. John Houseman. Um but a film that you know with Carpenter, I feel like I always go for the thing. Yeah, for sure. Um but this is one that I've been wanting to watch for a while. The poster is incredibly iconic. Mm-hmm. Um love Jamie Lee Curtis, so I'm excited to watch this with you next week. Yeah, same. This looks uh amazing. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Sweet. Ticking them off the list. Hell yeah. I'm excited. Looking forward to that. Sweet, um, sweet. Yeah, so that's the end of, of this episode. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Please um, share the show. You can find us um, on all the social medias at Film Church Radio, of course. And if you want to follow Lewis and I individually, you can find us both on Letterboxd, uh, which is the um, film social media app where you can log everything you watch and both lewis and i do that so you can keep up with us on there and see what we rate things on a daily basis uh you can find me at selman scope and lewis you can find at walker lewis 3007 you can also find us on all good streaming podcast platforms um so please share us with everyone and we're also on youtube where we have some extra content there um but yeah go um find us yeah we're there be a part of the church (laughs) um but yeah the only thing i have left left to say is happy father's day everyone where's the cake brandon i want my cake (laughs) oh say your film church prayers everyone (laughs) amen amen (laughs) 